coming up on This Week in Radio Tech. What a great show. Stephen Kurtz is our guest. We're talking about malware, ransomware, security, because Stephen has experience in both the broadcast world and the IT world. It's coming up next on Twerk. This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you by Broadcasters General Store with outstanding service, savings, and support online at bgs.cc. By the Ruby Console from Lavo. See Lavo in your future at lavo.com slash twert. By Angry Audio. Audio problems disappear when you get angry at angryaudio.com. And by the CalRec Type R console system. Type R is a brand new, modular, expandable IP-based radio system from CalRec Audio. Hey, welcome into This Week in Radio Tech, the show where we talk about everything from uh, from the microphone to the light bulb at the top of the tower. I'm Kirk Harnack, your host. Delighted to be here. And I'm in a, a different Telos Alliance studio this week. I am actually in my mountain command center, otherwise known as the cabin, uh, in East Tennessee, in the Smoky Mountains of East Tennessee. And uh, we're taking a little vacation this week, and I had a big uh, a project to do to fix some things here at the cabin. But we wanted to bring you This Week in Radio Tech. And amazingly... Yeah, you know, we can't pick up any TV stations here. We can pick up like one FM station here and a, a few AM stations, but boy, we got good internet. <laughs> we got good internet here at the cabin, so that is that's just awesome. I better be quiet. Don't let the internet hear that too loudly, otherwise it'll retaliate. This is the show. As I said, we talk about everything from the microphone to the light bulb at the top of the tower. And uh, I'm here uh, today. Uh, Chris couldn't join us. I work for the folks at the Telos Alliance. So if you hear me talking about some of their products or technologies or techniques, that's because that's what I'm familiar with. Uh, but it's not about the Telos Alliance, but they do sponsor uh, the studio almost wherever I go. So I appreciate that very much. Chris Tobin could not be with us today. He is off on a personal visit. So uh, he was hoping to, but it's it's lasting longer than he thought. But that's okay. Our guest today is somebody who is going to easily take up the whole hour with information that I want to hear, and I think you will too. Uh, let me go ahead and introduce our guest. It is Stephen Kurtz from Dallas, Texas. Stephen, welcome into This Week in Radio Tech. Hey, Kirk. How are you guys? I should Good. just say you. I was, I was expecting Chris too. I'm a little disappointed. <laughs> Well, hey, you're talking to, uh, you know, uh, tens, hundreds, or maybe thousands of people on the network and those who download the show. So, yeah, you guys is great. Yeah, and, and, and I'm a big fan, too. So, that's uh, it, it, this is great. This is great. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I understood uh, when I first contacted you, you said that you watched the show. So, that's uh, that's exciting. Absolutely. Um, Stephen, we're going to get started into some cool stuff, but kind of give us a little preview. You, you, what, a previous radio guy turned IT guy, and you get both sides of the business, Yeah. Absolutely. You know, I, I worked in uh, several different facets uh, of the uh, radio biz. I was uh, on air, uh, creative services, and then, uh, of course, broadcast engineering, RF, uh, things of that nature. So uh, IT kind of uh, came naturally to me my entire life. And I, you know, had the radio bug uh, from a very young age. So this, this just uh, kind of evolved into who I am now. <laughs> Okay, and and uh, IT is becoming such an important, in fact, critical part of broadcast operations, uh, and I think it's just going to grow more and more. And you know, we've had some guests on the show. Uh, a guy, a guy like Gary Klein. Uh, Gary uh, uh, has done some great presentations on uh, looking at IT as being incorporated into broadcast operations, and looking at it from actually kind of the CEO, CTO uh, point of view, where you've got to worry about, uh, hey, what does my mix of talent look? like now we're talking about for a big organization but big or small uh, it is critical because more and more and more of our systems depend upon uh computer networks and computer technology i think someday it's almost all of our tools are going to be it related to produce content whether that content is traditional radio or podcasting or we take snippets out of our traditional radio content creation and make them podcasts or on demand available or whether we're doing um television uh, type work or who knows what is is coming down the pike in terms of entertainment but people who produce content are going to have it systems backing that up and helping them do that am, am i am i on track there steven Absolutely. And, and, you know, uh, you, you said something very interesting. And in uh, I did watch the Gary episode, the one with Gary Klein. And, you know, being a former CTO myself, it's really important to, you know, of course, for me to understand and for all of us, you know, tech people to understand what's going on, but also to be able to communicate that, you know, to the CEO, you know, uh, and, and to the board at some in some organizations uh, and be able to, you know, illustrate its importance. It's just it's 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 so important. It's and it, it becomes more important every day. 
Well, uh, we're going to take a little bit of a look at this from the 30,000-foot view, but real quickly, we're going to dive into practical things uh, that Stephen's going to help us out. Uh, it was interesting, but we, we did a little show before the show where Stephen and I got to talk, and I gave him a few of my ideas and told him what my weak points were in IT, and I was delighted to find that Stephen and I are very like-minded on how to um, – uh, help operations along, but also protect uh, broadcast operations from all the, the malware and ransomware and things like that that are that are out there that are unfortunately part of our, our lives in, in, uh, in, with, with the public, public internet. So uh, Stephen's got some great takeaways. We're going to go through um, a lot of these for you. So, hey, have your pen and pencil ready uh, or pencil and paper. Uh, we're going to put a lot of these notes in the show notes as well. And Steve said he may even on his own company's website, totalit.com, uh, he, he will to see if he can put down a, a, a list there of the things that we talk about, some some of the resources. So I would pay attention Absolutely. during uh, the show. Yeah, for, uh, during the show. Hey, our show This Week in Radio Tech, episode 446, is brought to you in part by our friends at Broadcasters General Store. BGS. You'll find them on the web at bgs.cc. And one of the lines they represent is from Broadcast Tools. And oh my goodness, you know, you know, Don Wingett at Broadcast Tools makes all these cool little devices that really solve problems. Man, I've used his stuff for years, especially switching satellite channels, uh, um, uh, just all kinds of tools that, that to use from silent sensors, things that call out, uh, things that alert you. Well, now Don Wingett at, uh, at Broadcast Tools has this thing called the Pro Mix 4. Now, believe it or not, this is a little mono audio console. You're thinking, mono? Whoa! Hey, that went out in the 1960s. Nope. There are plenty of times when you need just a mono console. A mono console will do. So I'm talking about sporting events, parade coverage, doing a live remote when you have more than one person. Uh, the Pro Mix 4 can really help you get that done. Now, some of the features of the Pro Mix 4, well, first of all, it, it is a full-featured audio mixing console, perfect for broadcast studios and broadcast remotes. Um, and podcasting too. When you just have, you know, when you have human voices, you don't need stereo. It features three mic or line inputs, so each one can be mic or line, as well as a dedicated line input that, that can be switched between balanced and the internal USB codec. So a lot of times we have audio coming from our computer. We want to play that audio on our broadcast. Well, it's easy to do that uh, because it's got this USB. Uh, input. You can also then take the output of the Pro Mix 4 and record it on your computer through the USB interface. It gives you a program limiter, uh, balanced and unbalanced mix bus and mix minus output, while offering three independent headphone amps, along with IFB and program pan controls, and a whole comprehensive studio monitoring system. Uh, yeah, all in that one little box. Um, additional features, well, it's got uh, LED audio output level meter. It's got full duplex talkback capability if you get the Pro Mix Hub 6 controller. That's sold separately. Um, it has an on-air tally warning light relay output. Hey, how many times have you tried to incorporate a small console like a, a little Behringer or a, a, a Mackie console, and, and you don't have any way to turn the tally light on? Well, that's built in because broadcast tools comes from the... Well, the first word is broadcast, right? Uh, it can be uh, combined with additional Promix 4s or a Promix 1 unit. Uh, also, the Promix, uh, the uh, Hub 6, and hook them together with standard Cat 5 cables. Um, plus, it can drive multiple AHR1 Plus headphone systems. So lots of uh, possibilities within the ecosystem provided by broadcast tools. Now, here's the cool thing. The list price on this console is less than $700. And the street price, well... Where do you get the street price? You contact our friends at Broadcasters General Store at bgs.cc on the web, bgs.cc, or give them a call. They're really friendly, uh, and I mean that from years of talking to them and ordering things from them. Call them at 352-622-7700. That's 352-622-7700. You know, most of the people who work at, at BGS are... Uh, what you might call lifers. I mean, they've been there a long time. I just saw where my good friend Jessica Shoot uh, has been there 17 years. She is uh, celebrating 17 years of working for her family at Broadcasters General Store. So lots of good folks there. Give them a call. And I appreciate BGS sponsoring 
uh, this week in Radio Tech. Thanks also to Don Wingett at Broadcast Tools for being part of that as well. All right, it's episode 446. We're talking with Stephen Kurtz about uh, IT. And Stephen, let's do start for just a minute with that 30,000 foot view. Um, give us kind of, you, you do lots of IT besides broadcast. So you have a, a wider worldview of business operations uh, and, and keeping people safe uh, with a lot of different techniques. Give me your view of IT uh, and how you, what you do relates to, to broadcast operations. Well, absolutely. So, uh, you know, as you talked about before, you know, the IT and the broadcast, uh, it used to just be, you know, kind of in the business office and it got into the playout systems. And then, you know, it, it's really just taken over the entire, you know, broadcast plant and universe. So uh, really, it, it comes, it goes all the way from your playout to keeping uh, to keeping your web streams, your digital streams, your video, you know, uh, radio is just not just an audio product anymore. It's become such an interactive and a multimedia product that uh, IT has to support and the IT and your IT plan has to evolve uh, to support it. So uh, with all kinds of cool things like uh, VoIP coming into the studio, um, mm, yeah. uh, connecting, connecting you to your listeners everywhere, you know, and uh, Kirk, you're uh, uh, an expert at uh, studio VoIP, by the way. And uh, 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 so that's, uh, yeah. it's it, it just, it is all encompassing, all, all encompassing completely. You're right. And, and boy, it's just more and more apparent uh, as we go through time that this protocol, this TCP IP, and then variants like UDP and real-time protocol RTP, things like that, that the, uh, the Cat5 cable can carry almost everything that we need to produce media and and that's what we do and and you know, we talk we call the show this week in radio tech because that's where i come from that's where chris comes from but we end up branching out all the time into into video technologies and remote control technologies all of it carried over a cat5 cable and and almost all of it carried using uh this amazing protocol tcp ip so uh having knowledge of that i i know we've been drumming that into on the show here for years and organizations like uh the society of broadcast engineers or uh the the ieee uh and various state or state broadcast organizations all keep pushing that hey it is critical we got to learn this stuff if you don't want to learn it well plan on spending time maybe twiddling your thumbs at the, at the transmitter site only and then guess what the transmitter site gets more and more it uh so uh, i was gonna it, say it is, our transmitter <laughs> Transmitters are IP, IP too. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I've mentioned this before on the show, and, and I'll, I'll mention it again. Years and years ago, um, an engineer at uh, Eastern Kentucky University, and this was a long time. This was 35 years ago. I don't know how he was this prescient, but he said, you know, someday uh, we're not going to have TV cameras anymore. We're going to have computers that make TV pictures. And someday we're not going to have video switchers in here anymore. We're going to have computers that do video switching. And someday we're not going to have these two inch quad videotape machines. We're going to have computers that record and play back audio, uh, audio and video. And I don't know how he was possibly that prescient, but that's exactly what's happened, isn't it? Absolutely has. And, and it's so funny because, uh, it, it almost took, uh, it, it almost took the amount of time, you know, someday is, is, you know, it's, it's kind of relative, right. To, to each person, but it, it's, it's, uh, it did not take that long. If you think about it, it didn't take long at all for it to really just, uh, take over. So, uh, and, and, and then the technology that has also come along, um, has has been networking now we talked about you know com i just talked about computers that do this computers that, that do that and that's actually one of the presentations i've given at nab talking about we went from uh purpose designed equipment to general purpose computing and make it do things right uh but networking these things together has been a wonderful boon you know getting all getting your information passed around and letting different uh parts different things in the network do different functions but it also comes at a risk. And so I figured um, uh, probably the best thing that we could spend our hour really talking about is how to uh, design your networks uh, to minimize risk to those networks or risk to the broadcast operations and then risk to the business operations, uh, how we can design things to minimize that, how we can um, uh, uh, 
work on our operations, our daily operations, what are some things we can do to minimize risk? And I'm, I'm really talking here, especially about ransomware. Uh, uh, we'll get to that in, in just a minute. And then, and then how can we um, train people since people are usually, you know, the cause of, of that, of ransomware or other malware getting into systems, how can we best mitigate, you know, the, the, kind of the worst part of the system and that's people uh how, how can we we work on that so that's I'd, I'd like to kind of focus our hour on on minimizing that kind of risk uh you may have seen Stephen, and it was it was in the news um about uh, a, a good sized media company here in the u.s uh town square got hit with some uh, ransomware and it was uh, it was devastating to them for a few days it, I, I know some engineers with town square they worked their tushes off uh, over weekends and, and weeks to to get things back going again, to maintain uh, on-air operations, uh, despite the fact that a lot of resources uh, became unavailable to them due to ransomware. Um, I, I don't know if we need to try to pick apart you know, what they could have done differently, but let's instead focus on what any broadcaster, including me, I'm, I'm you know the the engineer for fourteen radio stations uh, uh, in on on three different pieces of land the you know, the the mainland Hawaii and American Samoa so um, let's let's kind of focus on what we can do so why don't we uh, Stephen I think why don't we talk about by you uh, start by you talking about the risks of malware and especially ransomware what is this stuff and 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 what can it do that's devastating to us. So, you know, I want to point out uh, that this large uh, uh, broadcaster is actually, you know, they're a media company as well. And in fact, uh, my wife's company uses the uh, website uh, branch of this large media company to actually do all their websites, their social media, things like that. They were impacted too. All their business systems were down. It didn't just take down their broadcast operation or, you know, encode mm -hmm. some music files or whatnot. It took down their entire organization from their VoIP phones at their desk. Uh, their email, um, you know, luckily their client websites weren't affected, but they couldn't get to the systems to update the website. So, you know, it, 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 uh, it, it was client impacting on all levels of the business. So the risk is, the risk is real. And uh, the risk is, uh, uh, is it, now with everything being IP, the risk is every kind of device. It's not just, oh, you know, I, we might lose some files. It's, it's not that simple. It is, Oh, what would we do if our entire business was down? What would we do if we lost everything today? How would we recover? Do we have a plan for that? Uh, how are we trying to prevent that from happening in the first place? Uh, and uh, in fact, I, I uh, reached out to a, a friend of mine that worked for uh, this large company while it was happening. And, and it was just incredible that, you know, it varied so widely. The security varied so widely uh, from mar even market to market within this company. And uh, some markets, you know, didn't get as affected. And other markets, they couldn't even, uh, they were playing music off of uh, literally a, a web browser. They were playing music off YouTube. Wow. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. So, um, uh, again, I, let's not uh, say here's, here's what they should have done differently. But let's talk about what, what no, Kirk should not. do, what, what, uh, what other broadcasters uh, should do. Um, and and the, to, to me, the scary thing is ransomware. Indeed, um, my my business partner and our radio stations uh, that we that we own together uh, are members of the International Broadcasters Idea Bank, and this is a small closed group of about a hundred broadcasters. And uh, I, you know, th th there have been people uh, in that organization, at least one broadcaster, that's also been affected by ransomware. I don't know the outcome. I don't know how they got it fixed. Uh, if they paid, if if they were able to recover. Otherwise, if they had you know, good backups and that kind of thing, but uh, let's let's if we could talk about that specific risk because of of all the things that scare me, that's the thing that scares me the the, the most. And I'm not even sure how much risk I'm at. I'm not in my head. I'm not exactly sure what all is shared with what across my network. I think we're not sharing much at all. But uh, well, in, on the on the broadcast operation side, yeah, we got we've got uh, some shared folders from different machines, but the salespeople. I don't think they really have much access into our broadcast operations, but you know, and then we got a couple computers that are dual nicked. So we've got some computers that can see the business network and can see the, the, the network that has to do with all the, the operations. So um, if you would kind of take us through um, ransomware, what, what's, what's the risk here and, and where do we start to mitigate that or reduce the risk? 
So I'll, I'll start kind of with an example of those uh, dual nicked machines. You know, it used to be dual nicks was, you know, your your firewall, so to speak, uh, between your two networks. And, you know, by having the dual nicks, you didn't uh, you didn't run as much of a risk. But with ransomware, you know, anything that you can touch from your computer, it can touch uh, anything that you're. So let's say uh, one of the biggest piece of advice I give people you know, your normal everyday users do not need any kind of administrative rights, even on their local workstation. Uh, there are ways around, you know, there are some specific applications that might require administrative rights. There are ways around that, um, uh, some of which I will uh, post to uh, post to uh, totalit.com. And I'm going to uh, uh, put up a uh, This Week in uh, Radio Tech twerk. Uh, I'll do a, a twerk uh, page. So totalit.com slash twerk. Uh, to put up some of the things I talk about here and some of the pieces of advice, but you know the the first thing you got to you have to remember is anything that your computer or the user that's on the computer, even if they're not an administrator, anything they touch can be encrypted by these things. And uh, these people are out uh, basically they they want money. That's that's really what they want. So they figure the more files they get, the more important files they get from you, uh, the more money, the the more likely you are to actually you know uh, give in and pay them. And mm. I, I will say that uh, that that there is a lot of success uh, reported by people I know. You know, uh, uh, Department of Homeland Security and the FBI say, "Oh, don't pay these guys this and that." You know, the people that I've seen that have paid these guys, these these people actually do uh, follow through and give you the decryption keys because they want other people to believe that or or to know that they're going to get their stuff back, and it increases their chance of chances of getting paid. So it's in these guys' best interest to to actually give the encryption keys. I'm not saying that you should do this. I'm saying that, you know, I do, I've seen that, uh, that they do actually decrypt. Uh, one of the biggest things is, uh, completely, you know, isolating any kind of right access to any of your broadcasts, to, to anything that you don't want, uh, uh, encrypted. Think about it like this. If you don't want it encrypted, it does not need to be writable from your workstation. What I mean by that is I see a lot of broadcast uh, networks where uh, a program director or a music director uh, can load music uh, right from their machine uh, in, into the automation system and actually access the file share uh, on the automation system uh, fully from their machine so they can put music in there. You know, uh, that's that's just that's that's asking for trouble. So what I recommend is making one single folder available uh, on that audio system, uh, out to your network if you must, and actually uh, copying or being on that machine and uploading the file uh, either uh, through its import interface or you know copying copying it into your audio drive on that actual machine. That way, you're not actually the only thing that gets encrypted. If you get infected, are the files in that particular folder, not everything else you know uh, in your entire music library or in your traffic library. It sounds like you're talking about um, an ingest folder. So you you set up a folder that your automation exactly. system goes and, and checks, uh, and so it, it can read from that folder. But a, and the program director or whoever needs access to that folder can write to that folder, but that folder can't then go right to the the main database of the automation system. Can't write to where all this music's uh, stored. So that folder acts like an in Absolutely. intermediary. Hey, yeah, store your stuff here, and the and the automation will check me every few minutes or seconds. And if there's, if I got something new, it'll 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 suck it in. And th and that is your uh, barrier between between the two. Yeah. That is correct. And I've set that up with a lot of different uh, automation systems. Uh, it's, you know, you know, some of them you write a script and you can have the check, script check or you can actually, you know, go into the automation system and, and actually upload the file. It just depends on, you know, what you use. But uh, it's it's really one of the most uh, effective ways at actually, you know, separating your two networks. Another thing is, and I know I'm sure, you know, I've heard guests before say this. I know you've said it. Do not. Do not, do not, your audio machines, your machines that are actually on the air don't have any business being on the internet. They just, uh, you know, whatever you must do, uh, you need to keep them off the internet. It's, uh, it's, it's just asking for trouble. So uh, there's plenty of, of on-air talent that wants to be able to play things from the internet conveniently. And so the only thing I would say is if you're going to have a machine play things uh, to, you know, on the internet, be able to play things, uh, maybe its only connection to the broadcast gear should be an analog or AES cable. Because so far, I don't know of any malware or ransomware that can go through an analog audio cable. Would that Not be yet. a don't reasonable give me any ideas. 
<laughs> absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Uh, you know, I, I do uh, I do some consulting uh, engineering work for a uh, uh, for a college radio station, and you know, we we have a dedicated machine that sits on the internet that actually sits uh, uh, out there, and uh, it's it's fed right into the board and all that through the audio router. We also have uh, uh, 3.5 millimeter uh, audio jacks. Uh, so they can actually plug in if they want to bring in their own laptop or, you know, uh, tablet or anything else like that. That way they can plug in. So we give them a variety of ways. But in any broadcast plant that I work with, you know, the talent, especially morning talent, you know, uh, if if I say, hey, you know, you could really just play that off your laptop. A lot of times they've got the laptop set up in the studio anyways. So why not? They just have to remember uh, to turn it off before their email, uh, their email ding comes on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, seems like a, a few years ago, uh, I heard uh, uh, under good authority um, that the, the, if there's only one thing you could go around your broadcast facility and do, it would be to go to every Windows workstation and make sure that the people weren't running with administrator rights, that they need to be running 100%. as a user. Yeah. Talk to me about that, because it seems like for for decades, if you install Windows and start using it, you were the administrator automatically. Now, maybe with Windows 10, that's different now. You tell me, but talk to me about how do, how do I, let's say I've got some workstations out there and uh, the people are, are in fact the administrator. I didn't realize it. How, how can I get them to switch over and just be a user and not have somebody as an administrator? So, yeah, uh, absolutely. In Windows 10, actually, it's still, uh, if you, let's say you go to the store, you buy a computer or you order one, uh, you open that thing up, you put it on your desk and you, you know, set your password and all that. You're the administrator. Um, oh my so uh, what it really takes is just, you know, go into the control panel, create another user, go into the user section, create another user. It's going to ask you what type of user do you want a standard user or an administrator, you know, Put them as a standard user. Uh, even better, you know, you want to take it a step further, which I do uh, in a lot of uh, uh, broadcasting and non-broadcast clients. Most of them, we actually set up a Windows, you know, domain, and we, you know, set up a Microsoft server serving Active Directory. You can do it on a on an old PC even. That way, you know, you've got a central point of control of usernames, passwords, things like that. Uh, it, it allows, especially if you, you know, are uh, it, when you have higher turnover positions, such as uh, uh, sometimes salespeople, things like that, it's really easy just to cut them off. And that way they don't have access. Um, but, you yes, know, absolutely I, make sure that your users are not admins. I would love to have uh, something. Uh, I've, I've never learned about how to implement Active Directory. None of my broadcast operations seem like they've been big enough to warrant uh, that central control. Um, but you know what? We're, we're, we, keep, we keep growing. Uh, we've got enough employees now. That might be a really good thing. Are, are, I, I would imagine there's plenty of resources on the web for somebody like me who understands Windows fairly well but never did Active Directory uh, where I would have control. Uh, how, how would I find out about how to get that done for myself? Absolutely. You know, there's a uh, there's a website, uh, you know, like Spiceworks, things like that. Even Reddit has some great forums uh, on there. But, you know, I'll put a couple uh, uh, links up on our uh, up on my page that I'm putting up there for you guys. And uh, just really and, and I'm also a resource as well. Uh, you with, you know, did you say 15 facilities? Is that uh, 15 stations? Is well, that yeah, 14 stations or so, but uh, and probably a grand total of uh, uh, probably 30 employees uh, across all those stations. Yeah, we, we have a yeah, absolutely six, six different locations. Yeah, absolutely. And you can use one, you know, and and if you've got the right firewalls, you know, you can use mm -hmm. one Active Directory server to feed, you know, to control all of those uh, locations. So you know, there's there's different ways to do it, and uh, you know, just like just like anything else. But I, I really recommend it that way. You know, users aren't sharing passwords if, uh, you know, or somebody gets an admin password to a machine or something like that. That way you're controlling, you know, everything uh, from the from the bottom up, really. You're starting at the very lowest level of the machine and then you're working your way back up. It, it really, you know, will will simplify your operation in the long run. Okay, so for guys like me uh, who are part of smaller broadcast operations, and I know that a lot of our viewers and listeners are in the same boat. Uh, they're just not the they're not the corporate size that that starts to implement these kind of things. Uh, learn about Active Directory and implement it, and you can put it on a, a, a cheap old uh, machine, and uh, on, and we'll figure out ways. Because what, what we can talk, in fact, you're going to talk about some solutions for getting different sites to talk to each other over VPN. Absolutely, uh, in some convenient, yeah, some convenient ways now. So, okay, that's good to know. So, 
don't don't let anybody be operating as administrator. Make everybody operate as user. If you need to, you know, be an administrator to do something, uh, then you know, hey, you, the 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 IT guy, the engineer, you log in as the administrator. Get done what you got to do. Log back out of that and let the users go on as as the user. Uh, so that and that, Windows that, is that was it, one Windows thing. is really good about asking too. So if they do something that requires administrative privileges, try to install a program. Windows will come up and say, if you're a standard user, it'll say, please enter your username and password or an administrative username and password to do this. Easy peasy, and, and that way, you know, a lot less risk. Not, you know, not totally mitigating it, but a lot less. So uh, another thing uh, that that uh, I, I've thought about ransomware, and we talked about this earlier, is at, at years ago at my stations, uh, when b- back when bandwidth was really precious, and we uh, we had this fear of employees spending half their day on Amazon.com or perhaps going to naughty websites that they shouldn't be going to. So I thought, hey, here's this uh, solution called Open DNS, and I thought it, it, they'll let you sign up for free, uh, and and you get a lot of you know basic functionalities. So um, uh, I I made all my computers. Uh, I'm actually I made my router. Um, use the open DNS as its DNS service. Uh, so uh, talk to me about open DNS and, and how that can uh, help uh, not only maybe keep employees from wasting time, but also can keep you a little bit safer, a little bit safer from ransomware. Absolutely. And, and it's, uh, that's actually great. You were so forward thinking uh, uh, when doing that. So that's uh, I applaud you for that. Um, uh, OpenDNS has actually evolved so much over the years. Uh, they have actually turned uh, really into a uh, security, just a, a DNS filter uh, security service. And really what that does, yes, it provides your content filtering. It'll it'll filter out the naughty websites, things like that. You want to block off uh, Amazon.com or Gmail or, or whatever to keep your employees on task, it's fine. But really what it does is is it actually analyzes traffic patterns throughout the whole entire world in real time and tries to find things uh, that match particular patterns, uh, things, algorithms that uh, ransomware and malware viruses use to block these websites. So this ransomware can't call home and get an encryption key. So this malware can't download the rest of itself off the internet. That's one of the biggest things is you might download or it might, you know, you might go to a website that downloads just a very small piece of uh, malware or of the malware Mm -hmm. puzzle and it goes out it calls out and says hey i need the rest of my payload here that way your computer uh antivirus doesn't detect it right away well open dns prevents that it actually you know goes out they actually look at algorithms and it's and it's all near real time and it's one of the only services that i've ever seen that can block some of this stuff even before you know a lot of the antivirus companies do so it does a very very good job at uh, filtering and actually, you know, preventing a lot of this stuff from even getting in your network in the first place. And another thing uh, I, I notice is, you know, of course, we we're talking about the human uh, element, which is always going to be uh, your biggest enemy. Uh, the human element, if you type a wrong website, you know, a lot of people still set up these domains that are close to a Google or close to <laughs> ABC.com, you know, yeah. uh, <sighs> it, you know, that are that are malicious. And as fast as they can shut them down, they'll they'll invent new ones. Well, open DNS prevents against that as well. Uh, their content filtering automatically, you know, recognizes, hey, this is a deceptive site. It tells you right away and it blocks it for you. So it's really, you know, it's it's really an easy and fairly inexpensive solution uh, to prevent a lot of this stuff from uh, from getting in and, and, you know, completing and, and actually infecting your network. Something else that I've heard for years is that, uh, you, you know, you, a lot of ISPs, and they're probably the big ones are better about it now, but for years, the ISP's own DNS server uh, was you know, the worst, crummiest machine sitting in the corner with just with dust all over it, uh, just sitting there, you know, uh, acting as, as a DNS server. Um but uh, if you if so, it was often worthwhile to use a third party DNS, not your ISP's DNS. So a lot of folks have used, you know, Google, what, 8.8.8.8 uh, or the new yep. one. Or there's a couple new ones, you know, 1.1.1.1 and 9.9.9.9.9. Yep. Uh, but still, I, I uh, open DNS. These people make it their business uh, to keep you from what well, to. to to control where your computers go. And a part of that is controlling stuff that you don't even know about. And, and by the way, those, those 
URLs that ransomware uses, a lot of those change every day. So they they set up you know slews of of um, uh, of, of, of you know, websites, if you will. They're they're just you know uh, IP addresses or servers uh, with a with a URL, and uh, and that's what OpenDNS tries to keep up with. That they see where stuff is going to and say, wait a minute, that's not good. We're do, we're gonna block that for our customers. Of course, you can you can whitelist stuff yourself if you need to, and that's no problem. I've had you know, I've had uh, employees say, I need to go to this site to get this information, and for some reason I'm getting blocked. Well, I don't know what. Okay, fine. Well, we'll we'll whitelist that for you. So, good good advice. And on you know, in 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 saying absolutely, and in saying that, you know, uh, I I've seen equipment that is now integrating Open DNS into itself. Uh, uh, another uh, thing I wanted to talk about, actually, uh, when when you uh, talked about routers that make VPN uh, easy, if you have multiple sites, or even if you don't, it's you know uh, makes VPN server so you can actually VPN into your network easy, uh, is the uh, Cisco uh, Meraki products. And they actually have open DNS built in to a lot of the features in there. So it's actually using that at the that intelligence at the router level as well uh, to to really prevent uh, these uh, these things from uh, getting out there and, and happening. It's it's funny. I have a junk machine that I've got you know outside of my firewall, and I call it my junk machine because you know I this is where I test everything. You know I'll I'll see a link mm-hmm. it come through in an email, and I'm wondering, okay, did this you know it, it'll it'll catch it. Uh, or I'll it'll get through a spam filter of some sort, and I want to see if the link is blocked, and I'll run it through Open DNS, and guess what? Boom! Oh, hit that Open DNS, uh, or hit that link, and I've got Open DNS on there, and and it doesn't even get through. It, uh, Open DNS says, "Sorry, you can't do this," and and they've already gotten it. You know, uh, it, it it that is how quickly they they can react uh, uh, to to these links and to this uh, ransom and malware. That is that is good advice. Good advice. So, uh, don't be an administrator and use Open DNS because uh, that keeps your computers from going out and getting bad stuff to a large extent. Hey, uh, you are watching or listening to This Week in Radio Tech, episode 446. I'm Kirk Harnack, along with you today. Our guest is Stephen Kurtz of TotalIT.com. And Stephen's a great guest to have on because he's from the broadcast world, uh, but he now he's in IT consulting full-time, so understands where broadcasters, you know, where, where they... S- stand and what they need. Uh, we're going to be continuing to talk about that, including how we, uh, uh, we know, what are some router solutions? Uh, how can we use VPNs to our advantage? Where is it necessary or really important to use a, a VPN? So all that's coming up as we roll along here on This Week in Radio Tech. Right now, we're going to take a quick break and hear from our friends at Calrec. Calrex Type R is a modular, expandable IP based radio system featuring three slimline panels, a fader panel, a large soft panel, and a small soft panel easily configured to give the operator full control. Layouts are saved and recalled quickly between shows. A single 2RU core with integrated I.O. gets customers up and running fast, and that single core can power up to three independent mixing environments with no sharing of DSP resources. Available in four DSP packs, and as your station grows, larger packs can be added, enabling it to grow with you. Power to the surface is supplied via standard PoE switches, keeping cabling to a minimum. Type R is fully AES67 compatible, as defined by SMPTE 2110, which means that it is also compliant with NMOS discovery and connection management specs. All these features combined make Type R the most flexible radio console you can buy. Find out more at calrec.com slash twerk. Thanks a lot to Calrec for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. Go to calrec.com slash twerk. Well, studio guests, you know, we're only human, and humans cough and clear their throats. We sniff a little bit on the air. Yeah, on the air. You can cure this, though, with the Angry Audio Guest Gizmo. You press the cough button, and it mutes the mic. Every guest needs one of these. You know what else guests need? And that's headphones, which is why each guest gizmo also has a studio-quality headphone amp with individual volume control. What else? Well, you've seen those mic arms with the built-in LED tallies. They're gorgeous, but how do you light them up? The Guest Gizmo does that too, illuminating the red light whenever the mic is hot. Installing the Guest Gizmo in your studio furniture could not be easier. You just need a two and three quarter inch hole saw and a steady hand. You don't need a router. Your studio gets a clean custom appearance and you get all the credit. So check out the Guest Gizmo and all the other cool gadgets at angryaudio.com. 
That's angryaudio.com. You, you need to go there and see what all they have for you. Uh, lots of cool things to make your studio builds prettier and make your station operate better. And it doesn't have to be a radio station. It could be a podcast studio, too. Angryaudio.com. Hey, it's Kirk Harnack along with Stephen Kurtz, our guest, and we are talking about IT and protecting us, your station against some of the bad stuff that's out there. You know, the, um, what I keep hearing, uh, Stephen, is that security is hard. It, it really kind of is hard. You got to think about it because the natural thing is for us to just connect things together. Um, oh, you know something we didn't talk about uh, in the in the pre-show, Stephen. That we it deserves a quick mention, and that is um, oh, now it's just left my mind. What's that website that's kind of like Google for the Internet of Things? Uh, something I O. Uh, oh, what am I thinking of? Uh, you can go to that website and and like search. Um, if you can search if this and that. Pardon? If this no, and not that. if this and that. No, no, uh, not that one. Uh, it's uh, it, it's it it shows you all the stuff that's exposed on the internet, uh, and it became famous uh, to broadcasters when Barracks, for example, a lot of Barracks codecs, uh, Sh- Shodan, Shodan.io. Shodan, yeah, I was and just going to say Shodan. Yes, 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 yes. It, yeah, that, 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 that's it. Uh, is it, we, we're going to talk about a little bit of do-it-yourself pen penetration testing, uh, but I've I've used Shodan to go. Act, hey. What does my station's public IP address, what's it revealing to you, if anything? Uh, is, is Shodan IO a, an interesting way to at least take a, a quick look at that? Absolutely, it is. And uh, I'll post a couple links on uh, on my site as well. Uh, there's quite a few. And uh, really, you know, uh, I would say at least, uh, you know, I make it a part of my, you know, quarterly kind of things to do list uh, just to just to make sure, you know, run a check on your IP Run a check on your firewall. Make sure you know you're not uh, uh, you're something that you overlooked or something that you thought you opened up for that uh, nice new uh, NVR you got to monitor all your cameras. Uh, make sure something <laughs> isn't open that needs to be open. There are so many different solutions now that don't have to uh, uh, use your firewall uh, or for you to open up ports uh, in your firewall. It's quite amazing what we're able to do without without doing any of that. Well, let's talk about that opening ports in your firewall. For years, it was uh, not uncommon practice to uh, open up a uh, do a port forward so that you could or do several port forwards or lots of them so you could remotely get into gear that is at your studio. And yeah, for some time, you, you know, I, I know that these these so called script kitties, uh, a lot of them will get a, a, a hacking kit, right? And and they'll they'll uh, they'll set up their scripting to. You know, go through lots of IP addresses, public IP addresses, and and scan. We the used most to get Heath kits, port. and now they get they get those hack kits. So, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, and I thought, well, you know, uh, you uh, you can do a little bit of security by obscurity, although it's not at all fail safe. You're still open, but I so I would use really high port numbers, and and then port translate those to the port numbers that I wanted within within my operation. And I felt safe enough for a while, but I kind of don't feel safe anymore doing that. That's where VPN comes in. So why don't you address this topic of port forwarding? And, and you know what, before we get to VPN, let, let's, let's indeed talk about uh, broadcasters need to remotely get into things. And sometimes we need to get into things where VPN is not a strong possibility. So let's say audio codex. I want to go do a, a live remote broadcast and I want to get in and I want to take my my Comrex or my Telos thing or whatever it is and I need to get into the same thing back at the studio and a port forward has been the way to do that. Is that still the way to do that or are there other things that might be a bit safer? Absolutely. So I am. I am almost positive that uh, uh, Comrex and uh, I and and Kirk, you'll have to uh, educate me on the uh, Telos solutions. Uh, they are actually starting to integrate VPN clients in to their to their codec to their to the remote side of their codecs. Uh, VPN is always a preferred way. If not, yes, the high port number. That's 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 absolutely the way to go. Also, if you can get somewhere that has a static IP and only open that, you know, let's say you're at a high school football game, you want to broadcast, and the and you know that the school district has an IP address of this to this, whitelist that range and don't let anything else in. The the smallest, littlest hole that you can open, the better. You know, the the smaller the hole, the better. 
That's a good point. And, and uh, at the moment, uh, I don't know of any Teleskier that has actual VPN technology built in, but what I, uh, when I've talked to our developers at, at Telos, hey, uh, let's say you open a port, let's say you pick some port number that your Telos Zip 1 is going to be listening on. Uh, listen, and typically, it's, it's communicating with uh, the Zip server. Uh, on that port and the zip server, it's a, it's a point of presence server uh, that keeps track of you know hey where's the IP address for this this particular uh, device, and um, <clears throat> uh, uh, the if you open a port to a zip one, I'm told by the by the the, the, the developers that it's that zip one will not respond to anything anything at all that isn't a request from another zip one or, or an RTP stream. Uh, you know, from from some other codec, uh, if 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 that's the port that 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 you're hitting. So, well, what about you know? I'm I'm trying to hack into it. They said it it throws all that away. Now, I I trust that to a large degree. I'm 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 not saying it's hack proof. There's, there's always really good hackers out there. But at least um, uh, in the world of audio codecs, let's not use the same port number that the audio codecs uh, HTTP interface is on. Right or or it's uh, or it's SSH interface or it's Telnet interface. But if you're going to open a port for the audio to come in, uh, at least the Telus ones, and I would imagine the others too. If it's if it isn't what they're expecting, they just go, huh? That's not for me. Just drop it. Now that doesn't prevent a DDoS kind of attack on that port uh, or somebody Correct. else. You know, yeah. So I mean, th th there's still danger there. Or an uh, impersonation. Seem... You know, you uh, uh, you can impersonate. You know, let's say they impersonate an RTP packet, and that way, right. you know, maybe inject some audio that you weren't expecting them to inject. You know, it's pretty advanced, but you know, these hackers are in, in these guys that are writing this stuff are very, very, very advanced. And we were talking uh, in our pre-show uh, about how these guys are uh, in these in the, mainly in foreign countries. They have these huge offices in there uh, with benefits and uh, dental and health and all these other things. These are real legit. They're running them as real legitimate operations, and, it, and it's uh, it's it's insane to me uh, that they're using it for this purpose. Uh, but the money, you know, the, they're going where the money is, and if there wasn't money there, that's you know they wouldn't they wouldn't be doing it. So. Uh, my, my biggest thing is, yes, it will discard the packets, uh, you know, that it, that it doesn't like, uh, however, however, that does not mean that you're, uh, immune to things like a DDoS or e even some kind of impersonation, uh, attack or, uh, you know, using that to, to spoof out, uh, packets to another IP address, who knows, uh, they can, they can find something, you know, if, the, if you give them a, if you give them a little bit, they'll take a lot. Good point. Good point. Um, uh, one technique that I've seen some stations use is they get their internet and their corporate WAN, you know, from the corporation. If if they need to hook up codecs to the outside world, they'll just get a separate uh, drop from Comcast or whoever their local provider is, and 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 they'll put a router or a fire a firewall on that, and that only goes to uh, ports on codecs or other gear that is expecting you know where, where they have to do that uh i guess there's good and bad to that um um i i, I don't know it, it, obviously you you want to if you can get to anything in your business besides that codec uh on its audio on a port that's expecting audio you, you got to re-examine what you're doing because you don't want somebody to, to, to get in get in otherwise i've also seen uh, you know a lot of backlash the other way to where some uh, radio stations or broadcasters have been hit by malware and in response, they just close everything. And so you can't do broadcast. You literally can't do a broadcast. So there's gotta be, you know, I never uh, think IT that's the here. answer, you know, there, yeah. th that is never the answer. You know, I, I've never been a fan of the, well, you know, you guys broke it. So we're just going to pack up our toys and go home. You know, that's, uh, uh, there, there are good ways to do it. And, and separating your connections is, is actually, uh, uh, really smart. As we go forward, you know, there are devices actually out right now, such as like a uh, cradle point router, uh, which yeah. uh, actually it's kind of funny. I've been seeing these ads uh, on Facebook uh, that are advertising, quote unquote, trade show Internet. And it's designed for people that have uh, that go to trade shows all the time. And it's really just a, what's called a cradle point router. And what these routers do, they're, they're your normal router. They've got, you know, enterprise features. They've got VPN so you can connect back to your studio. They'll establish a VPN uh, or to your, you know, back to your office or studio or whatnot. They'll establish a tunnel. 
they can use anything. So, for example, you can plug in a uh, USB device from an AT&T or a Verizon uh, and, and they'll establish connection or you can plug into uh, uh, an Internet connection somewhere else and they'll and they'll pick up the connection and then establish uh, uh, VPN, things like that. But there are, you know, solutions now to securely do this and they're not, you know, those routers are not. Uh, not that entirely expensive, but I have seen, you know, uh, these different companies, at least uh, in beta firmware and things like that, starting to actually integrate VPN, uh, much like uh, some of the commercial or the uh, uh, commercial grade IP phones. A lot of these IP phones that you see have VPN clients uh, built into them uh, so they can get into the networks of large corporations and make, you know, place phone calls uh, without creating a risk. So I, I think we're going to see a uh, a lot of more of this uh, VPN as a uh, as kind of just a uh, an expected feature uh, as we go along, it's, it's, it's really, uh, becoming the norm. I worked with an organization who used to, uh, up until actually they still do now in some places, but they actually issue you a public IP address for every device. And, uh, you know, that worked great in 2000, 2001 when, you know, or even in the late nineties when, you know, it wasn't that big of a deal. And now they're in a big push to get everything behind the firewall, this, that, and the other. Uh, but they're having a, a tough time because the network is so large. My point there is that, you know, as a broadcaster and having a facility, you know, in, in this type of setup, it was great because when we first got this IP equipment, we could go and hit it from anywhere and we could do whatever we wanted. Now <laughs> it's all behind a VPN and you're, and, and honestly, you know, your phone, your phone has a VPN client built right into it. I mean, your your uh, my you know your your Android, your Apple, your phone has a VPN client built in. You don't have to do anything. You know, you can go in there. Uh, I leave mine connected most of the time. Uh, in, in that way, even if I'm on a public Wi-Fi or anything like that, it's not you know I'm not being uh, uh, viewed by other folks. So uh, VPN is going to you know really it, it, it's already become a way of life. So I, let's let's talk a bit more about VPN. I want to make sure we also talk about the the router solutions that that uh, that you you uh, told me about. But uh, so one thing to define is is when we say VPN, there are a number of different things that that we can mean by that. It's it's a virtual private network, right? But uh, we hear lots of advertising for a, a personal VPN, uh, and this is uh, there's free ones and there's paid ones. And they're really for uh, when you when you are out uh, in, in a public place, and you uh, you want to you, you want your data encrypted and secure, and, and until it pops out somewhere else on the internet, uh, and so you maybe you don't want uh, uh, to, to be on uh, on uh, if you're on Wi-Fi at a pu on a public Wi-Fi. There's even ways to hack into into encrypted Wi-Fi. Um, but th this helps keep you safe from the people who are around you or from your ISP or somebody else's ISP that, that you're using. That kind of VPN may keep you more secure at a, ho at a Starbucks or in a hotel environment or in a trade show environment, uh, but it's not it's not a VPN all the way to your transmitter site. So make sure I've got that right. These... these uh, uh, you know, VPN services that you can, you can subscribe to that keeps you safer in your local environment, right? That is correct. So, you know, there's really, there's really, uh, uh three types in my mind. So you've got the commercial okay. VPN, right? Uh, these VPN services that you, uh, uh, that you're talking about. And if you ever listen to somebody like, uh, Kim commando, they ad advertise all over her show, you know, uh, right. there's all kinds of personal VPN, uh, you know, and, and originally those those were used to actually hide activities. If you wanted to do something maybe that, you know, maybe not been on the up and up or you wanted to look at something that yeah, they were used for that. Now, you know, there are these pocket sized devices smaller than your cell phone that somebody could set right now, right down on the table next to you. Uh, at Starbucks and look exactly at your traffic, sniff all your packets, see exactly what you're doing, pick up what you're doing on your bank account, things like that. Um, and so those those. Uh, uh, commercial VPNs is what I call them. Uh, those commercial VPNs are perfect mm -hmm. for that. Um, okay. The other, you know, two types of VPNs, uh, you've got what I call a client server VPN or a client VPN. That's where you want to connect to your, let's say, uh, uh, Kirk, you want to connect into your business network at your uh, at your office or, you know, at one of your facilities. Uh, you use a client, you use a VPN client, very similar to one of the commercial ones. Uh, you use mm -hmm. that client to connect to your business and you can actually go out onto your network and out of your network there, look like you're in the office, work like you're in the office, but you're really, you know, at home or uh, at Starbucks or even on the airplane now. Uh, 
Uh, so that's what I call, you know, client VPN. And then the third type of VPN is called a site to site tunnel. And what that is, uh. is it takes your router, uh, this site to site, it takes your router and connects it with another router over the internet using public internet, but it's all encrypted and it's, and, and it basically creates a wide area network for you. So you can hit machines on the other side as if you were sitting right there on that network. Uh, a great way to use this uh, a lot. And I see, you know, I use it a lot this way as well. Uh, it, it, you know, not only for companies with multiple locations, but any broadcaster, you already have two locations in most situations. You've got your studio and you've got your transmitter site. Uh, connecting mm -hmm. your studio to your transmitter site without having to open any public ports on the internet. So you, you can actually use this uh, environment to basically uh, have two internet connections, one at your studio, one at your uh, transmitter site, and send all the data, audio, whatever you need to send uh, securely and easily, uh, but it's not over. Uh, there's no ports that have to be open, so you don't have to share things uh, between, open up things for, from your facility that are going to make you uh, uh, at risk uh, for any other kinds of uh, attacks. Uh, it's also very uh, useful uh, if you have, like Kirk, you know, you've got multiple stations, augmenting your networks, connecting them all together uh, that way. Oh, did I have it? Uh, I, I had this spot on on the station over here, but I need it over here. So let's go pull it and bring it over. <laughs> yeah. You can do it just like if you you can do it exactly as if you were on the network there at that location from any of your locations. So it really, you know, there's a lot of benefit uh, to the uh, site to site VPN tunnels. Uh, and, and each of them are designed to protect you and to protect your uh, equipment just in different ways. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. All right. So uh, it, it turns out that at my radio stations and my transmitter sites that have internet, uh, we, we're using Microtik routers, and uh, I have found them you know, somewhat challenging to set up for more complicated things. They do have a wizard in the Microtiks to set up uh, a, a basic VPN uh, server, and then, uh, it, and, and then uh, I, I get into it remotely. But the only one that they set up on the wizard is uh, the uh, PPTP style of VPN. And, and so, so, you know, that's been deprecated by a lot of people on my Mac, for example, Apple doesn't even offer a client for that. I had to buy a third party Correct. client because it's, it said that it's not uh, secure because the password is apparently sent in plain text. Um, that is I got to believe it's, it's, it's better than nothing. Uh, but I really need to move to a more secure technology. And I've uh, been studying that on the Microtext. I just haven't been able to get it done yet. But, uh, and, and I've loved the Microtix, that the hardware has been really good for us. We like it in a lot of ways, but I think there's some, maybe some better, easier to implement technologies nowadays. And uh, let's chat about that for the couple of remaining minutes we have. You mentioned Cisco Meraki, Absolutely. and, you, and yeah, you're probably going to mention U Ubiquity. For me, the Ubiquity is probably Absolutely. more in my price line, but... but Tell me, tell me about, about these solutions. Sure. You know, uh, and, and, and yeah, absolutely. So, you know, if you had asked me, you know, five years ago for a really good, you know, uh, uh, inexpensive firewall uh, router solution that, uh, uh, that, that, for, for your situation, I probably would have said Microtik myself. And, and Microtik does make, you know, really good, really good devices, really good hardware. Where they have fallen short is the uh, the interface, the user interface, uh, the the really the ability to, you know, get things done and actually keep their uh, uh, OS updated. Uh, it, not in the sense of uh, security, but more in the sense of features that, you know, uh, are required now for uh, the world we live in today. And so that's why I find a lot of people, you know, uh, uh, shying away from Microtik, unless you just need to connect to the internet. And uh, for that, it's fine. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. So I'll kind of start out, you know, I love the Cisco Meraki gear. Um, I really like their routers uh, uh, slash mm -hmm. firewalls. They make a great product. Um now they're a little bit different than your. Uh, they're, they're similar to a Sonic Wall, and they're similar in price to Sonic Wall, to a WatchGuard, things like that. Uh, they they use a subscription model, but they also take it a step further. Uh, they they are cloud controlled and cloud based. You get your own cloud instance, uh, and and it really they're 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 really plug and play. So let's say you bought one for your uh, one for your studio uh, in in American Samoa, and then you put uh, one in your one of your stations in Hawaii. You know you plug them in, uh, very minimal configuration, all point and click, and you would be connected together in in no time at all. Uh, they make a great. Uh, 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 they also have a lot of advanced security options. 
Uh, they have a lot of the open DNS technology built in. They have a lot of what's called Cisco AMP. Uh, that's one of their advanced malware uh, protection. That's built in. Mm. Uh, their Cisco uh, ATP, the advanced threat protection, that's another Cisco technologies. And these are things, guys, that you find in the $10,000, $50,000 $50, huge firewalls uh, and routers uh, that they've brought down to a uh, to a cloud-based in a uh, uh easier to swallow price range like a SonicWall, uh, like a um, uh, Sophos or a, um, uh, a e even WatchGuard, things like that. In fact, I uh, pulled a WatchGuard out of a client the other day uh, and they were like, wow, this is, this is, this is cheaper than the one we had before. And it's so much better. Well, that's, that's right. Because they, they actually realized that uh, they can corner a lot of the market uh, th that the, the firewall market's kind of been a little stale and they've really, you know, brought these advanced features, and nobody, you know, nobody's been able to match them yet. Uh, a very, very close second, though, I, I say that kind of with a grain of salt, uh, is uh, the Ubiquity uh, folks have have really done a great job uh, of making all different kinds of products. Uh, they make uh, switches, they make routers, they make a lot of cool uh, wireless access points, but also point-to-point uh, -point wireless. So I've used them in STL situations before, uh, even sure. with uh, 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 some Telescare before. I've, I've used uh, uh, some of their products over point-to-point uh, uh, point, -to -point, uh, point, -to -point links that have uh, less latency than a network cable half the time. So uh, they they really uh, uh, ha have shown uh, that they are a very quite capable company. And uh, one thing I will go back to Meraki for a second. You know, they do make uh, wireless devices and switches. I don't like those as much only because the, they actually brought the subscription model to a switch and to a Wi-Fi device. I don't feel like those devices are uh, as necessary. Uh, um, you know, your, your router and your firewall, you want that to be up to date at all times. You want the most security. Your Wi-Fi router, you know, they 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 do it because that's their model or their your Wi-Fi access point. They do it, uh, you know, because that's their, their sales model. I don't necessarily agree that I my switch. Uh, I need to have a subscription for it or it's going to stop working tomorrow when it runs out. So, you know, one thing to keep in mind, you know, my, my, I, I call it my ultimate combination. If I had my druthers, you know, I'll use a, uh, Meraki, uh, uh, security appliance and then I'll use a, um, uh, a Unify, uh, switch and, uh, wireless access points and things like that. So going to the ubiquity though, uh, their Unify line of, uh, security gateways, uh, is, is phenomenal. They have done really, really well for us. Uh, they're very similar to the Meraki in that they work in so many different situations. They're, uh, very easy to configure, or they're complicated. They're, they have all the things easy, but if you're a shell guy, you want to get in there and SSH, SSH into the device, you can do that too. Uh, they also offer a, uh, uh, you, uh, to run a unified device, you need something called a unified cloud controller. You can actually uh, install your own unified controller locally uh, uh, or on your private network. Uh, or you can buy what's called a cloud key for, I think they're $100, uh, and you get access to their cloud service. I, I run my own controller for all of our clients uh, out of a data center. Uh, that way, we're controlling you know end-to-end -end everything. But it, it is a complete dashboard of everything, very similar to how Meraki does. Uh, uh, it is a complete dashboard of your connectivity. If you want to do VPN, it's all in there. Your client VPN, your site-to-site uh, -site VPN, uh, easy to set up. Uh, they they make a really good and efficient device, uh, and, and their pricing is uh, is really unmatched. You know your trade off there is some of the security that uh, Cisco leverages from their other products. Of course, not as much as in in the Unify products, but you know for a you know uh, versus a micro tick or something like that, uh, the Unify I, I would take it any day of the week. Absolutely. Got you. I'm going to be looking in, into those. Uh, and, and I've used a bunch of uh, Ubiquity products as, as STLs, just as, as you have, even running uh, uh, Axia Livewire ac across across those. And, I, uh, I've done the same thing. And, 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 and I was, that that's one of the things uh, uh, with the Axia product and with the, uh, uh, with the live wire product that just, I was like, wow, you know, I, I, I didn't have a doubt that it would work, but when I saw it working over those point to point several years ago, uh, that I had set up, I was like, I, I was blown away because it just, 
the the amount of things we're now able to do, uh, we can we can put things anywhere and, and have it work. You know, I was running those off a uh, uh, 120 degree sector from a uh, actually using it to to do a remote broadcast uh, just very oh. close to a studio, just not mm -hmm. in the studio. We did a 120 degree sector out towards because they had to move around a little bit and had to be a little bit mobile, but not completely. And it and it worked flawlessly. So they've huh. taken really their their expertise and and they've built these uh, built these unified security gateways and, and really brought it to you know the other side of the equation as well. So uh, we have got to uh, hear from our last sponsor. We'll be back with a tip of the week from Stephen Kurtz. Stephen Kurtz is our guest with TotalIT.com. And uh, Stephen was in the broadcast world uh, doing a studio, RF engineering, uh, also a, a talent on the microphone. And, uh, and now he is into IT consulting. So he gets it from all the ways that we broadcast engineers need. We'll be right back after this from our friends at Lavo. There has probably never been a better time in history to buy a new radio mixing console. Today's consoles are more sophisticated than ever, with more features and functions than you can shake a stick at, but have you noticed how complicated they are? There's a sea of knobs and switches and displays and buttons. Some of them look like you might need a pilot's license to do your show. Well, a board doesn't have to be complicated to be powerful. Just look at the new Ruby mixing surface from Lavo. The first thing you notice is how smooth and streamlined it is. Ruby has lots of cool tech, but what it doesn't have is that confusing ocean of buttons that clutter things up. Now we all know that there are some console features that Jock only uses once in a while. So why dedicate controls to them? Ruby fixes this problem by moving those once in a blue moon controls to a touch sensitive, customizable GUI that happily shares screen space with your other studio software, helping you fight control room clutter. Thanks to this design innovation, talent that use Ruby produce smoother shows with less errors. Controls that are used the most fall naturally to hand, while functions that rarely need adjustment are easily controlled with just a couple of clicks in the context sensitive GUI. And Ruby has cool features you won't find on other boards, like AutoMix, an intelligent gain writing function that guarantees the perfect mix for multi-mic morning shows and call-in segments, dual-mode snapshots that instantly switch the motorized faders between on-air and production modes, and enough DSP and I.O. options to make even your pro sound pals green with envy. And because quality is as important to Lavo as it is to you, every console is proudly built to fanatically precise standards at Lavo's own factory in Germany. If you're ready to declutter your control room, do yourself a favor. Check out the new Ruby and the other cool Lavo radio tech at www.lawo.com slash twert. Thanks so much to Lavo for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. We really appreciate that. And do go to that website, uh, lavo.com, and add the slash tour. Take you right to the radio gear, and uh, it'll also let them know that we sent you. Hey, it's Kirk Harnack just finishing up this week in Radio Tech, episode 446. Stephen Kurtz uh, has been our guest. And uh, rather than me take up any time with a tip, or maybe I just didn't bring one, uh, we're going to give all that time over to Stephen for a tip of the week. Steve, what's a great takeaway for broadcast engineers? Absolutely. So, you know, I'm going to put a lot of this, uh, again, on our uh, website, totalit.com uh, slash part, and uh, get that uh, up there for you ASAP. Some of it's already there. Uh, my my big takeaway or my big tip of the week uh, is is kind of something that's a little bit more obscure in networking, but something that you that I use all the time. And I, I feel like it has a very big uh, place inside the broadcast plan, even even in office environments, things like that. Uh, and, and it is a term called VLAN, and a VLAN is something that you can add to your routers and to your switches to let you have different networks on one cable, on one mm -hmm. wire. And it is a very good and effective way to segment your network out. Uh, it, you know, don't worry about having to, oh, my gosh, I got to rewire my whole thing and buy new switches, things like that. A lot of your switches already do this. And it's a very good way to protect yourself, uh, to keep yourself uh, uh, segmented so the bad stuff can't get in to your most critical operations. And I'll again, I'll put some more details on that, but that's my, you know, 80-20 T's there. And just to make sure I understand, uh, VLANing uh, is, is not just uh, uh, assigning different uh, IP address segments, you know, like a 192.168.1. something or .2. something or .3. something. VLAN tagging is is even a little bit different than that, isn't it? 
Absolutely. And and yes, you want to put a different uh, IP address range, but it actually mm -hmm. physically uh, separates your uh, your uh, devices or your networks uh, on one switch or on one piece of gear. So you don't have to uh, basically, let's say uh, you've got your uh, studio and you've got your office networks. Well, you can run them on the same cables, on the same switches, uh, same routers, things like that. You can put a VLAN in there. That way you have different internet access rules. You have different uh, mm -hmm. uh, firewall rules, things like that, uh, even in between the two VLANs. So the networks can't talk to each other. It's basically like having separate networks on one cable and being able to break them out with something as simple as a switch. Or you can tell your switch, hey, I want this device to be on this VLAN, this device to be on another VLAN. Uh, VLAN stands for virtual LAN. And even uh, even things like VMware and, and Microsoft Windows, uh, they are now, uh, they can understand this tagging. And so it, it, just, it just makes it a lot easier to really segment your things. There's really no reason why we can't start, you know, doing even more uh, segmentation in our in our facilities. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Well, uh, let's, let's we'll see if we can get a link to some VLAN education uh, on our show notes sure. as well. And by the way, I, I, I do see that you've already started that web page at totalit.com slash twerk. That's very uh, that's great of you. I appreciate you doing that. We'll have that the first thing in, in the show notes as well. Stephen, uh, man, I appreciate you spending an hour with us. I wish we had three hours to spend. We could certainly talk about Absolutely. a lot more. Absolutely, yeah, but... me too, <laughs> me too. <laughs> our, our our time is up, and I want to thank you. Uh, tell us uh, real quick about totalit.com, and if a broadcaster feels they need expert service from you guys, how how do they reach you? Absolutely. So my email address is uh, on that uh, totalit.com slash twerk, uh, stephen.kurtz at totalit.com, or uh, you can give us a call, uh, area code 972-383-7330. Uh, we don't just serve the Dallas area. We serve all over the country. We've got clients all over the place, uh, both broadcast and non-broadcast. So we have familiarity, uh, uh, lots of familiar familiarity with all things IP, all things network, uh, really just a, a great resource and and, and really uh, just want to uh, make this as good as possible for for people. That's that's our goal. And we're, we're strictly business. We don't do, you know, residential or anything like that. We are business focused. Awesome. Awesome. All right. We'll put that in the show notes as well. Stephen Kurtz, thank you so much for being our guest on This Week in Radio Tech. Thank you, Kurt. Uh, again, uh, uh, our friends uh, Chris Tobin uh, couldn't be with us this week. Hopefully, he'll be back. In fact, he may be hosting next week. I'm kind of on vacation next week, and I don't know if I'll be here or not. Depends on what, the, what my wife has planned for Thursday afternoon. So Chris may be with you uh, uh, doing the show himself next week. Hey, I want to thank uh, our producer, Suncast for doing such a great job, as always, of producing This Week in Radio Tech. Thanks a lot, Suncast. Also, thanks to Andrew Zarian, the founder of the GFQ Network, where you'll find lots of other fine fo podcasts, including What the Tech and Matt Men and lots of other good stuff. So check those out right here at, uh, at, G at gfqnetwork.com. Hey, we'll be, be back next week with another show. I'm Kirk Harnett. We'll see you next week on This Week in Radio Tech. Bye-bye.